Hi, my name is Kim Stroud and I'm the director of Ojai Raptor Center. And Ojai Raptor Center has been in existence since May of 2000, though I've been rehabilitating wildlife for 15 years. And we are a nonprofit organization. We depend solely upon donations but uh, from the public and corporate matches and grants. So we took in a thousand birds last year, a thousand the year before, and as people find out about us, we get in more and more wildlife. We specialize in birds of prey, though we do not say no to any animal that walks in our door. And we network with other facilities that may specialize in, say, foxes or bears or skunks or deer, where we take in raptors, all kinds of songbirds, some seabirds, and um, a lot of small mammals. Our release rate is about 65%. So that's a really high release rate because we get lots of juveniles that have fallen out of the nest. Now, because we live in an urban area near Santa Barbara, near L.A. County, we take in all the animals, that, the raptors that come in from the shelters that get brought to there. So um, we get a lot of babies that have fallen out of nest. Not necessarily that these babies need to have come into our care because they're, if they're healthy juveniles, it's better to leave them with their parents. Let me just fix that. But because we live in a, a very condensed society that is taking more and more of the habitat away from these creatures, it is dangerous for them to sometimes be left on the ground. There's cats, dogs, cars, people that may not be sympathetic to the animal um, or try to care for it improperly. So it is important that we get notified and pick up these animals and get them into our care quickly as possible. We are licensed by State Fish and Game and Federal Fish and Wildlife. You have to carry certain permits in order to do this. We carry about seven different permits from state and federal government in order to care for the animals. As you can see, we're in my backyard. This is where we house most of the education animals that are not releasable that we take out and do programs in the schools and community events with. Our goal is release, 65% go back in the wild, and some unfortunately die. And I think one of the birds that you came up to see today did pass away. It was a red-tailed hawk picked up in Montecito um, about a week ago, and that animal was starving to death. Unfortunately, December, January, February are the critical months for red-tails. They're, when they're a first-year bird, they have to define their own territory, they have to locate prey base, and it's been, this last year was a very, very rough year all the way around for our wildlife. We had the fires in the back hills, we had um, drought, so we had no water. When there's no water, there's no grass grown, and the rodents don't populate and, and become available for the prey base of the raptors. So really rough year on wildlife. Our release rate this year was only 50%. Still good, 50%, but not as good as the year before. And primarily that's due because of the drought and the fires. The fires pushed all the animals that were in the back hills down into our area, and so that's kind of squeezed the resident raptors and the prey base got smaller and smaller for everybody. Um, so we did lose that bird. It was about half its body weight. But we're going to show you a few other birds that are slated for release that, that did make it, and um, hopefully we'll do a release later on, and you can see what our goal actually is. Um, information there. We do have a lot of information on there. It's www.ohiraptorcenter.org. And we can be reached at 805. 649-6884, and that's also on the website. We have barn owl box plan, kestrel and screech owl box plans, lots of ways you can help wildlife in your own backyard and, um, and see some of the birds. One of the ways we do raise money is to adopt the birds. You don't really get to take the bird home. We keep it. It's a sponsorship program, so that's also on the website. Ways you can help, and all of that would be on the website you can check out. are going over to the 100 foot flight cage to look at some red tails. We're just about ready to be released. And we're going to let one go. Okay. The rehabilitating birds require much larger cages than the education birds because the education birds are all injured in some way and they don't have uh, flight, most of them. So that we follow minimum standards for, from a U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Fish and Game on caging requirements for birds of prey. And each of the birds, depending on the species, requires a different size cage. 
Now, there's no cage big enough for a peregrine falcon, so that's why we put them in our into falconry programs. And really, there's no cage big enough for an eagle. Three flaps, and they're across the minimum requirement caging, which is 100 feet. So I'm currently building a 200-foot flight in our new facility that's going up. And uh, we'll have the biggest flight cage of anybody in California that I know of for eagles, which will be great. We get a couple eagles a year, anywhere from two to four. They come up from, down from San Luis Obispo, over from Lancaster, Edwards Air Force Base, um, over in that area. And we took one from the Eastern Sierra Wildlife Group because they don't have a facility either. Actually, we took two eagles from Eastern Sierra Wildlife, which is up near Bishop, and we flew them up there in private planes a couple months ago and released them back in the Bishop area. It was very fun. Um, one of my new volunteers is a, a pilot. She teaches flying lessons, and she uh, arranged for herself and another pilot to help us fly those eagles up to Bishop, and we released them back in to where they came from, which was very exciting for the Bishop group because they rarely get to see their birds come back. Now, this flight cage is on private property. Uh, we have a lease agreement, and um, it is not open to the public. Contrary to the education birds, which we this, um, rehabilitating birds, we have minimal contact. We, they see us once a day for food, and that's it. We want them to be wild. We want them back in the wild. And so we do not let people come and visit them. As soon as we can. If they're an adult bird, we try and get it back to the same area it was picked up in uh, because they usually have a mate. If it is a juvenile bird, we don't worry about it. We release where we know there's a prey base because juveniles have to find a new territory anyway. They get kicked out by their parents. And um, we know where there's good prey, so we, we kind of monitor and we work with different wildlife biologists that let us know areas that are loaded with rabbits or squirrels or gophers or things like that. So we built this cage about four years ago with a lot of volunteer help. And the one that we're currently building will be twice this size. This is a 100-foot cage. And a lot of these birds are almost ready to go. Double door systems on all cages are required by federal law. How many birds are in here? Nine. We have nine birds in here at the, at the moment. Um, and what birds are we looking at here? Mostly in here we have red-tailed hawks. Uh, we have juvenile red-tailed hawks. We have adult red-tailed hawks. We have a vulture. Um, that vulture back there, if you is from Santa Barbara. It was picked up by Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network and brought over by Randy. It was on top of somebody's roof, flat out almost dead. He did have a wing injury as well, so he's still recovering, can't fly great. And yesterday we had a turkey vulture visitor on top of the aviary visiting him. So they do bring in other birds. Um, another one of these birds, one of the juvenile red tails, is also from Santa Barbara. Uh, was found in the, the duck pond, uh, soaking wet during the last rain, starving again. Why was it in the duck pond? We have to look at what injury brings the bird in, what possibly, that, that may be the presenting condition, but it's not what caused him to go into the duck pond. Uh, he, he went into the duck pond because he was starving. He was going after something he did, wouldn't normally go after and got soaking wet and he is about ready to be released, but we will send him back out with Randy because um, Randy picked him up and brought him over and he should go back to Santa Barbara. So we banned all of our birds. I have a federal banding permit. Um, so this gives us some data on some of these birds. Uh, what, if they get picked up with the band on them, it gets reported back to the lab and then we get a report saying this bird was picked up 
and then we get data on how good a job we're doing. Um, the best data we had was a red-tailed hawk released in Simi Valley turned up in Toronto, Canada 12 years later. So that was great, a great release. So we have different bands for different types of birds. So you're going to put a band on this bird before you release it? We are, and that way it gets tracked. It, so basically, if a, if a bird comes either back in for rehabilitation, say last year we got two birds that we had rehabilitated and released. They had bands on them. One was a great horned owl, and it came in hit by a car for the second time that we got it, and it had been out there for two years. So we know that we did a good job because it was hunting successfully, probably had mated, and then unfortunately got hit by a car. We were able to re -re rehabilitate it and re-release it um, once again. Uh, we had a red-tailed hawk from Carpinteria that we had banded and released, and she had been out there a year. So that's that's that, those are good statistics for us because then we know that that you know you wonder sometimes what you know how, are these birds making it out there? Are they are they doing okay? So I'm gonna look for it. Now, when you feed these birds, how do you know that they get their fair share? Um, that we put in plenty of food, and we also occasionally we pull it. If, if it looks like they're not eating, or I mean, you can tell by the way they're flying that these birds are all in pretty good health. But sometimes we'll pull them in and weigh them, and we can tell by the weights if they're doing okay. So you would put the food on these platforms. We do. And we put enough food in here for everybody, so there's no competition really. They all get plenty of food. And we know how much they um, pretty much can hold in their stomachs, so we know, you know, if, if one red tail gets a rat, that the, you know, everybody else is going to get a chance to get one. Okay, now's the fun part catching them. <laughs> First, I have to figure out who I want. How do you decide which one to release? Well, like I said, some of these guys have to go back to where they came from. So they have, some of them have uh, pink bands on their legs that are just colored plastic bands that we take off when we release them. There's a, fr a vulture on the outside visiting. Flying away, see him? Oh yeah. Now am I going to be in your way if I stay behind you like this? No. I'm going to be moving pretty rapidly once I decide who I want. You can see, if they keep me running a 100 foot flight, I get a little exercise. So this is a big female red tail. And she came from um, over in Somas. So Somas isn't that far from here, so she'd be able to get back over there real fast. Do here just to protect me. Now we have three red tails right there, so this is not a great place to release her. We might go out towards the lake a little bit because if I put her out here, they'll just attack her. 
I was hoping they wouldn't be flying here today. Those are our resident raptors. So this is a crimp band that we put on. Come here, baby. These are a little bit harder to get on than the butt bands that go on our barn owls and our red shoulder hawks. Then if this bird ever gets reported, it's got a number on it that gets turned into the federal banding lab. And then, like I said, they notify the person who picked it up and the person who banded it. chase her out, but those birds. Where do you keep the food? Where do I keep the food? Yeah, wh that you're going to feed them. I brought it over with me from... Shami gave me a bag right before we left. <gasps> yes. So what's in there? Uh, we have a variety today. We have some rats and some day-old baby chickens. Now we purchase um, we purchase most of our food from various farms that raise these for feed. So they all come frozen and we thaw them out. Now if um, we do raise our own rats and mice to train the youngsters on, it's what they eat, so we have to do it. Will they come and feed while we're in here? No. They won't. I'll wait till we leave. One of those birds there, the one on the left, is a red tail from Goleta that was picked up in the Goleta Edison substation. She created an electrical arc um, from two power lines and fell, created a fire, dropped into the fire, and burned all her feathers off. So we'll have to keep her until probably October of next of this year. She has to molt into her new feathers and um, then get reconditioned for flight. So we'll have her for a long time. Eventually will be released and others take their place. 
we can go over there if you want. Yeah. We're um, currently working at our new site, our new facility. We have about three acres, and we got a, um, two grants, two different grants, to build the outside caging. So we're putting up six new flight aviaries, one of which will be double this size, two will be 50-footers and two 24-footers. And then we're also putting up some intermediate caging so because, as, as you saw, they're, they're, if they're injured and they're in one of those small vet racks inside, they can't go out from a vet rack into a 100-foot flight. It doesn't work. So we have some, we're going to build some smaller 18 by 20 flights that they'll go into intermediate staging and then fly out. So uh, we're in process of putting those up right now. And hopefully we'll have them up by the busy season, which is, starts in about April. We can get anywhere from one to 20 birds a day starting in April. It's crazy. That bird is a juvenile Swainson's hawk that came from the Eastern Sierra Wildlife, which is in Bishop as well. And um, it missed migration. Swainson's migrate to Argentina. So we now have to hold him through the winter. We'll get him up to Bishop again in March when the migration is going back north for breeding. So there's nothing wrong with him now. He's perfectly fine. He just needs to be wintered over. So tell me what, uh, where we're going now. So we're, we were going to release this bird near this flight area, but there was three resident red tails flying outside. And if we did that, then it would just chase, they would, the resident red tails would chase this one immediately out of the territory. So instead of putting it up where we know it's just gonna get chased, we're gonna drive a little ways to a place that I know has great prey and release back there out by Lake Casitas. We used to go out on every single call, but we don't have the resources to do that. We're way too busy rehabilitating 1,000 animals a year to go out and pick up animals. So I try and talk the people into trying to get it contained and get it over to us. Um, if they take the time to pick up an animal or you know report it, because sometimes it takes 10 phone calls to get to a live person. Most of us work full-time jobs and do this full-time on the side. You know, I have to stop make calls, try and get a transporter there to pick up those animals and bring them in. And sometimes it takes, I called five people, nobody was home, I got the sixth person to go out and get the Los Olivos bird. And then I gave the woman in Agora two numbers of volunteers down in that area. So. When are you going to teach Randy this? Oh, the fluid therapy? Yes. Well, him and my, my dad, Tom, because uh, Tom wants to learn it too. Because they both, both of them have experienced getting in these birds recently um, that were so down in weight, they needed fluids and they didn't know how to do it. So we're going we're gonna to teach them how to do it. We're looking for a location right now. We were going to do um, our fundraiser, our auction, silent auction fundraiser at the Old Creek Winery and they, um, they can't do any functions right now. They need to apply for CP. And then we'll have our concert, uh, our concert at Libby Bowl in October. Where? Libby Bowl, downtown Ohio. Oh, good. Last year we had Jackson Brown. Oh. oh. Some phenomenal success. Oh. Sold out. So now this location, you think, um, would be a good place for the release of this bird? Where we're going? This area back in here is behind Lake Casitas, and it's all designated watershed land. So there used to be houses back here. They ripped them all down. So there's a lot of acreage and a lot of area for, for um, the wildlife to disperse back here. So this is one of my favorite sites back here. Plus there's a lot of um, prey. Very few people come back here. And it is monitored by the rangers at the lake. So um, they kind of keep an eye on traffic back here. A lot of wildlife. There's a woodpecker. There's a falcon right there on your right. Yeah. And they have, um, there's a lot of land. This is all either forest, national forest, or large, large um, ranches owned by people that are favorable, favorable to um, having wildlife on them. So it's, I just, it's a great spot back here. No fences. Get her band number on here. Do you make a notation as to the location? Yep.
you have to GPS the coordinates for um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. moment right here when we release these birds back into an area like this. Um, this girl's been in our care uh, since the beginning of December and she's fattened up now, ready to go. And we normally, a lot of times we'll just release them right out of the box, but if you're ready, let me know when you're ready. Give me a signal. We're ready. We're going to go. You see her now? Yep, she's in the top of the tree. You see her? She's right in the top of this tree right there. Oh, yeah, okay. And she'll probably look around for a few more minutes and then take off again. And I hear some scrub jays, so they might come and harass her a little bit. They never look back and they never say thank you, and that's okay. We just want them back out there. But that was probably about two months worth of food for that bird, plus some medical expenses. It cost about $150 to rehabilitate um, an a on average each of the birds we get in a year. You know, a lot of times they've been in a flight cage and, um, you know, they're, they're back out in the open now, so they just land in a tree for a few minutes and then they take off. They're just very happy. That's cool. She's just doing a little shake. That's called a rouse. That's a sign of comfort. She's happy she's not in a cage anymore. When is the mating season for this bird? They're, they're pairing up right now, and uh, uh, they start building a nest um, now. Uh, they usually have their chicks in April. They'll lay eggs March, February, March. There she goes. That's what I like to see, a good flight. Well, this is uh, exactly, this is good. I mean, she didn't land on the ground. She flew up into a tree, a couple, and flew to another tree, and then she's taking off flying now. She's doing really good in her soaring. She's strong, she's healthy, and that's, uh, that's a great joy to me have her be back up there. Hopefully she has a good life. Has lots of babies. Keeps those red tails flying.